Welcome to this Coach Education webinar. I'm Gareth Marr. I'm delighted to be joined by Republic of Ireland under 17s head coach and coach educator Colin O'Brien. Colin, uh, before we get started on your topic, I just quite simply wanted to ask, how did you get involved in the coaching? Obviously, you had a very good career League of Ireland level, but when was the first steps you, you took into coaching? Um, I suppose oh, my first steps, I would have been around 15 or 16, Gareth, not so much the teams, yeah, but uh, maybe through work experience in, in, in school, um, helped me out on, there wasn't maybe organised summer camps at that time, but uh, I remember Mick Conroy, he was be running the, the FOSS scheme here in Cork, uh, it was Coca-Cola camps at the time and used to help out some summers with him with that as well, so kind of dipped my toes in early, just working with younger players, uh, more in kind of primary and secondary school side of things. And, um, you know, got, got, got a taste of it there. Did you have a, a feeling quite early on that, that that was something you wanted to pursue, even as you were still playing? It was, yeah. I would have been always interested in it. Uh, I suppose when I was playing then, um, you know, I started doing some of my uh, education then. Uh, at the time, I would have been the, the FAI introductory course, uh, probably still one of the most important courses I did, uh, gave me a really good uh, foundation regarding planning and organisation, something we're going to be speaking about today, that whole preparation phase. Um, really enjoyed it, uh, got, a good, uh, got a good buzz from it and um, you know, moved on to doing a level one course. Um, when I was playing then, I did my B licence, I got a, a, an injury that had me out for nearly nine to 12 months. So I used that time to um, keep my education going. And uh, then I did my A license and my pro license, um, but I had good timings between a lot of those um, courses as well. So I got an opportunity to put, uh, we'll say the theory into practice. Um, so I took my time. So you've literally gone all the way up the ladder from the starting point to the very top. Yeah, it's something looking very proud of. Um, and I'll say, you know, coaches, I'm working in the coach education department by myself. You should never undervalue the stuff at those early, um, you know, education levels. It's the PD, PD1 now, PDB2. Those are courses really, really important. They would have been the old introductory courses in my time. And um, as I said, there's a lot of things there that helped me in my foundation as a coach and in those formative years that um, I still use. And you just might modify things as you go along. But um, it was a really important part of my education. As mentioned, you're now the under 17s head coach, and um, last summer 2019, you were going into your third successive finals tournament with the 17s, and, and that's what your topic is, is, is going to be on now as well. Yes, um, so look, we've been in a real privileged position. Um, you know, I've worked with the association for, for a good number of years, I've worked as a development officer in the Cork region, worked on many, many programs, worked at all different levels as well. Um, you know, different age groups, both genders. Um, so got a good flavour for what's gone on at the game. And then I moved into the area of, we say, a player development coach over 10 years ago, which was a link into the International Coach Education Department, which is now the High Performance Unit. And I've been there ever since. I've uh, been involved with our international teams from under 15s right up to our 17s. Um, so I've seen a lot in the last number of years and how, how everything is we say developed through education and um, player development. And within that program, also worked within the Emerging Talent Setup, which was a big part of our um, national development plan also. Okay, Colin, um, you prepared a presentation for us and a couple of clips to follow uh, all about your topic, which is the preparation to the opening game of the 2019 Under-17 European Championships, which was held in Ireland, which was a fantastic tournament for us to host. Um, do you want to take us through it, Colin? Yes, look, it was a it was a really good experience. Uh, you know, very privileged position for for all the staff and players last year to you know as host nation. Uh, so I felt, you know, just the preparation side of it as host nation, how that was different to maybe some of the previous years. We feel people we find out some interest, giving some insight into it. Uh, so I've just got a few outcomes first with regards to it. It's, it's it's really just to share some knowledge from the experience, just in that whole preparation side of things. Um, engage with the 
coaching community. Um, you know, we're all missing the play and, and being on, on the pitch at the moment. And I know there's a lot of people watching in at different levels. So that'll be the next third one there regarding the grassroots and UA for coaches, whatever level you're working at. If you can take one thing from this, take it away, and hopefully you might be able to add that to your club or, or school or whatever level you're working at. And also there'll be the, the, the additional CPD hours for people if they choose that. Uh, which we'll speak about at, at the very end. Um, regards some of the content, we're going to just look at the, the backroom team, uh, the program of events, to the pre-finals, so our whole program from when the players came into us uh, to when we finished. Um, a few points on the key differences to previous years, um, from hosting it to actually going through qualification process. And then we're going to look at some transfer of our training to the opening game. So that will be a visual part. So we're going to just piece together some pictures of things we might have worked on, why we worked on them, and where they maybe were executed in the game. Um, that's, that, that, that's what we're hoping to achieve, basically, from it. Okay. So our backroom team... Um, this would have been our, our, our team of people... Um, Going into the European finals, um, myself as head coach, Ian Hill, assistant, Kevin Doyle, Josh Moran, Michael Luby, Shane Power, two video analysis. Michael would have been head person for that. Shane would have come in with us as the opposition analyst. John Flynn and Rory and our medical team. Gary would have covered kit and equipment. Mark McNamee and the team operations. And Garrett yourself got the experience of it from the whole side of media officer and communications. Um, just a few things to mention here. I, I suppose for people looking in, not everybody here is 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 a is full time in the international setup. So just myself, I've been the full time person here regarding the, the high performance unit, with regards to education and international, and also the team operations. Um, everybody else would either be working within the association or else external. But the big thing here with the backroom team, like with Ian and Josh and Michael and Shane and Gary especially, they all have an influence in the game as well around the country uh, regarding its grassroots or, or the elite side of it. Um, they've all gone through their own education as well. So, you know, a lot of things from the international side of things, just not for myself bringing it back, but these people would bring back a lot of good information to the coach education department, to certain courses, and also that will be put into our curriculum at, at, at different levels then uh, through the education system. And they would uh, they'd have a big influence in that. So okay, they'd hold up the roles in the international staff. Um, yeah. But also it's that link that, you know, stuff comes back into the whole uh, organization as well. Also experience of coaching, Colin, like with, with Michael and uh, Gary and Shane and, and Ian, like they, they bring that coaching eye to things as well, even though they're doing specific roles within the backroom team. Yeah, very skilled in what to do, very educated in what to do, um, and very experienced. And, and that, that's important for me because you're not going to see everything as a head coach. But the fact they had that knowledge of the game as well and that background in it, yes, they'll have to find roles and specific roles when they're in. Um, but they're, they're a great help to me um, and to the whole program. For this was your third successive uh, European Championships at this level. And some of the staff would have been with you um, with the previous tournaments. How, how important was that to, to kind of have that continuity? Yeah, it was great. I think continuity is a big word with staff and, and, and the experience. Yeah, look, we learned a lot from the previous two years. Um, uh, maybe how to navigate going through when you're actually in the tournaments. Um, you know, really prioritising. Um, there can be a lot of sideshows leading up to a tournament or when you're in a tournament. Um, and, you know, really keeping focus on why we're there. Uh, and knowing what's important when you're when you're working with players. Very good. That's just really the you know it's 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 really really important you know the player the person is to the forefront of everything we do. But that relationship with the staff, as you can see, all the little kind of bubbles on the outside, um, it, it's massive how that works. Um, you know, use the word relationship. That that's really important. And, there has to be good chemistry. Um, everybody understands their roles and they have to contribute. But, you know, to get the best out of the players, um, everything behind the scenes has to be put in place. And, and, and all these people are vital cogs to the, to, the, to the middle one to work. Would you have 
put more emphasis on this going into the 2019 Euros than you did into the maybe the 2017 finals in Croatia? Like, did it become much more prevalent and important to you to realise this, or was that always the case? I think would have been would have been always the case, but I think we would have picked things up along the way, certain learnings uh, that we were able to take from year to year uh, and put into our, we'd say, meetings, pits, it basically into our working environment. Um, but really, you know, what prioritising what's important pre-tournament, during tournament, post-tournament. I suppose the one key thing with last year's group uh, and, and ourselves working with the staff is we knew the outcome of the season. So we knew starting off where the journey would end um you, you know each of the previous years your aim is always to get to the finals this that last year we knew we were in the finals um so maybe our objectives which we'll talk about a little bit when we come to the program events um might have changed or tweaked a little bit um but you know i can't you know i can't speak highly enough of these people and and and, and that whole area of you know that relationship with the backroom team and chemistry how important that is when, when you're in a tournament because it's 24 7 everybody's in uh you've got to be able to get along with people um and you've got to be able to work with people in, in that environment it's really important there's no going home sure um can okay, just ask it's a very interesting uh graph to look at because i would say everybody interconnects with the player how do you ensure the consistency of message that everybody ultimately the head coach will want a certain type of message delivered to the players so that when you go around the circle that message doesn't dilute or do you know what I mean that it's not mixed messages coming into the players then well, that's where you have to have your clear objectives it's when you have your you know your your, your own staff meetings um you know that the staff contribute to, to, to that as well um and be very clear and you know how we conduct ourselves as well um you know the values that we probably set for the players we all have to adhere to so you know if, I heard Tom speaking last week about uh, players being late, but you know, staff also have to be on time, you know, so that punctuality, if, if we're talking about a value or what we expect from the players, uh, we, we, we have to live that and act that when we're actually, you know, in, in camp with them, that, that's really important, right through the staff. Um, and uh, that's an important point. Very good. So we're just going to take you through here. Um, the program of events basically you know, said we, we, we would have known where we were going for the season, but there'd be a lot of forward planning done here. So this would have been the first phase. Um, first of all, the new group of players would come into us from the 16s, from Paul. They'd normally be finished their 16 international season around May. Uh, the players in this country, June normally there'd be no games short to the, the exams. And then basically we restart in July with them. So we'd have that connection and continuity, we say with Paul through, through, through the previous season. He'd have taken from Jason and, and Niall before that, Niall Harrison with the emerging talent, which would be a real important point to all of this as well. But when the players come in, um, it's a new group. Firstly, for ourselves, they're coming into new staff. Um, and that process, especially that kind of July, August, September, um, we're getting used to them and, and they're also getting used to us. Um, but, you know, you, you really have to set your stall out from that July, August, September camps. Um, it's really important. They know how everything is working and, and they get a feel for us as well. It's so, important to note as well, Colin, isn't it, this, that they're stepping up to competitive football for the first time at international level from Paul's under 16s. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the the stage of development is changing a little bit for them. So that so when they come in in July, a lot of the players now are, are finished um, schoolboy football as such. They're going into a new stage now, maybe into the youth side of it. Some of them may be going up a little bit higher, depending on where they're at in the club. But also you have, with this group particularly, um, in the last number of years, you would have had a lot of players now going to the UK to, to, to start... Um, to, to, to basically fulfill maybe their their dream and it becomes a reality that they're they're now going to the full time setup there and other players are coming into the national league setup here so you've you've got that crossover um, so they're they're leaving home some of them now at that stage and uh, you, you're also dealing with that change with the players and this was this was different than other years your preparation obviously you can see um, <clears throat> what you had for September and November because we were a host nation so you didn't have to qualify. For this tournament so that changed things slightly for you 
Yes, it did. And, and it's just that program of events of in who you actually play and, and why you try to get them was really, really important. So we, that, that, that assessment part in July, you know, we'd get the list off Paul. Um, there'd be certain players invited in. Um, we, we'd have a look to see where the players are at. Uh, they'd be all home based, um, but also at that time as well in July, the National League is up and running. So you, you're just not looking at them, you know, to bring them into a national assessment. You're also watching them in their games as well because their their league will be up and running. So that month there'll be a lot of assessment going on, and you'll always say to players, look, you, you just never know who's at your game. And the way the recruitment has gone here now in this country, I think it's a lot better for players. Um, you know, Rude has put um, Noel King now as head of recruitment. Uh, head of scouting, uh, both here and, and, and UK. And so north, east, south, west of the country, um, you know, we've got people watching matches every weekend uh, at different age groups. So that, that, that's really important for us, the recruitment. And even though this, with the 15s and 16s in emerging talent, there's so much goes on there with the players regarding the, the environment set. Um, but it's a massive, they're massive age groups for player identification for us as well. Um, and yes, as you said at the start, when the players come in now, it's 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 they're, you know they're they're getting ready now for tournament football with a competitive edge. Okay. The training camp um, in August, we 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 would then bring the players in. That would be maybe three three four day camp. Uh, again, this is where players now from possibly the UK would come in. Um, and we'd start our process there. We'd move into a double header then against Turkey. So that would have been maybe the start of our steps as well, because we we, we would have, I suppose, been able to plan to play in Tala, um, to stay at the, the hotel base um, in, in City West, where we were hosting the tournament in May, an opportunity to train in Abbottstown. So we started to get a feel now of how everything works for our own facilities at home. So that would have been an advantage. The opposition-wise, why Turkey, we've had a good relationship with them for a number of years. Um, always good standard, Turkey. You, you'll always get a bit with them. What I mean with that, you'll be tested, but you'll also have a, a part of the game where you'll get opportunities. But um, it's, it's a good opening game for us. We, we found any time we played them, they, they, they've been tight matches, and uh, we, we've got a lot from them. So that would be September. So again, your objectives, you're looking at players. Um, that, that's probably a big part of it. Does anyone come out of the list? Maybe that mightn't have played at 16s or 15s or that was on the list or is there a new player we can find? Um, always lucky at that. And, and we're assessing the players as well um, that, 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 that were in the last number of years to see how they're actually doing at this stage as well because there can be huge jumps in players, Gareth, within three to four months. Um, and, and it's important the players realise that as well and, and it's something we always outline to them. There's no guarantee um, we, we can never say that they'll be in every squad and it's something we always speak to them about when they come in um, at each event. So that had been September, we would have found out a bit about players and again they would have found out a bit about ourselves. The, the November tournament then was a real important one because what we didn't have was the actual qualifiers. So you can see the teams in it. Both England and Germany over the last few years would have been ranked number one and two at the under-17 level. So they would have got a boy in the first phase. So the first phase of under 17 and 19 European Championship qualifications are normally played in the month of October and November. So basically the preparation in November for us was England and Germany wouldn't have any qualifications. So they were guaranteed to get them. Um, and they would always look at it being in the finals. So they would have used it as an opportunity to prepare themselves. And the Czech Republic had played earlier in October. So they took up the, the invitation to come in and make it a, a 14 tournament, which was really important for us to get uh, because that what was going to replicate what comes in, in May. And you can see the quality there. That, that would really be um, a European finals group. Um, so this would have been a new challenge for the players. And also the length of time now for them. Uh, would have increased. And obviously, you're picking these teams with the objectives that you've set, just saying you've outlined, and the staying in the same hotel is important for the players to understand the travel distances, the same training grounds, all that kind of stuff. All, all of that kind of gives them a real kind of a familiarity with what to expect them when the tournament eventually rolls around. 
Uh, yes, it did. Um, again, we were able to stay in the, the City West Hotel, so that we the host hotel. We were able to use Abbottstown, you know, the, the training facility there. Really, really good pitches for us, and we tell as well, which was in you know every time we use it was was really top quality. Um, but the big thing from us with prep, yeah, you, you know, you, even things, you know, your bus company, who you use, your distances, your traveling, you, you'll get all that in and uh, you'll pick things up along the way for ourselves. Then maybe, you know, that worked, this didn't work. Uh, we need to be careful of that. So th that goes into the post tournament, basically. But the big plan then here really was to put players into, you know, this is what a European group is going to look like. This is going to be the standard you're going to be up against the length of time now you're in. So it's the first time, the length of time there. So usually they might be used to maybe seven days, eight days with double headers. Um, but this now could go, you know, you could be 11 to 13 days together uh, in a group preparing for, for, for three matches. Does that give you as much an assessment of a player being ready for a tournament as playing training or playing the game that time in a hotel and around the place? Yeah, you have to observe everything because they're, they're at different levels. You know, like some of them be very mature to be able to handle that. Um, some might not be yet. It doesn't mean they're not going to go on and be a player. And mm -hmm. that, that, that might be feedback or something we'd have to speak to the player about and their club. That, that would be something we would always do um, when, when we're finished events, make, make that communication line with their club coach. But going into that tournament in November, like especially you know, Czech Republic, we've played them in the past always get, you know, good measure of games there. But England and Germany, you know, their tier one teams, you know, it was an, an invaluable experience for us because it really put a, a lot of things into perspective for maybe where we thought the players were at, maybe where they were taught they were at themselves because you really would be put to the pen of the colour uh, against those countries. So it was a really, really good test for us. And uh, we learned a lot. And um, that then puts in that whole process of decision making then once once that phase and, and, and prep tournament was done but really invaluable to us. Okay. So we then would move into the second phase of our planning. Um, I suppose to mention at the end of November the home base league would be finished. Um, so they'd be off season now and the boys that be in the UK they'd be they'd be coming into their you know the second half of their season so you've got crossover of two seasons with the players at this age group as well uh, so in January we would we bring a home base group in again uh, we'd link in with the Irish schools part of it and we, we, we bring them in for a game basically be a certain amount of players see where the players are at and then in February it'd be another international window um, or event should I say and basically again you look for quality opposition so this again we would have been planning well in advance um, Poland and Belgium ourselves so it was a little triangular tournament but no we'd have brought the players out of the country so we would have went to Spain a lot of countries do that basically February can be a tricky time as you know with the, the weather especially in Ireland um, we, we've had experience with that before uh, hasn't been great to the preparation so to play these two countries again, bring the players away, you'd be maybe seven, eight days away, another good test for us uh, and, and, and learn plenty about where we were at. And, um, you know, again, Belgium would be a tier one country at this age group. And, um, you know, we two really, really good games against them. And, and, and every player would have played over the two matches as well. So that would have been a big part of our objective to make, you know, to assess the players again and, and, and give them good game time to see where they were at. So obviously Belgium were one of the teams that you happened to draw against as well. So you got a little bit of, again, familiarity by playing them in, in that game. Yes, and, and the Czech Republic as well in, 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 yeah. in the November tournament. It, it pulled out of the hat for us in May also, or in April. Um, yeah, look, Belgium at this age group, again, um, you, you'll get a good indicator uh, of where you're at. Um, you know, it was a really good game, um, again, you know, we, we kind of struggled for the first 25, 30 minutes in that game, best of my memory. Um, and the second half, we were really, really good. So, 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 so we, we took a lot from it. Um, and, and during all these events, Garrett, I suppose it gave us a good chance, you know, to, to tweak certain things about our game, about our principles. You know, we might have used certain matches to, to work on a certain press, uh, to work on a certain attacking kind of objective. Um, yes, that will to win the game, you know, that, that would be in the players, we would promote that. 
Um, but at the same time, um, we'd be always looking to tweak certain parts of our game and, and to see see where the players are at with that. So we we we'd have to press, put pressure on them at times in training, uh, and at the matches to see see how far we could go with certain, we'd say points in our strategy. Um, who you have is really important to, to maybe how you play. Yeah. Um, and we might have to tweak certain principles for certain games. Um, but the players would have learned a lot from that and they would have been given opportunity right up to, you know, right up to those February games as well. So again, we had a good idea where we were coming out of February. Did you, have you ever experienced, Colin, maybe not with this group, but with a previous group of players where you have a set style of play or a certain, uh, way you want to approach things but then you realise that the players maybe aren't capable or not at the level to f- fulfil that in the way that you want to do it and then you have to change things slightly Yeah I think that's one of the, the things I've always learned maybe working with different groups yeah I might have an idea how we, we'd have our principles 100% but you know who's in front of you can really determine how, how that be played so it might be an example with a midfield triangle um, how you might play it with one group might be a little bit different with how you play with, one, with another group. Um, but we'll still be looking to, to get across some of our messages. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a big thing, who you have. And also, you know, we're not their club coach. So the players, they could be playing in different positions at their club. Yeah. They, they, you know, a lot of the same messages they'll get at their clubs, but there might be certain tweaks. So, you know... The example there with wide players, a lot of wide players now learn to play on the inside a lot. Um, sometimes we might be doing a practice where we want them to maybe play on the outside. And, you know, you will get something back from the player saying, oh, no, this is what I do at my club. And, you know, you're not disregarding that or disrespecting it, but you're trying to say to the player, look, there's another way here. We just want to, to help you with your development. So that's always a challenge because if you're working at something or if you're doing a principle as a young player, you're being told something you know, every every day of the week, basically, of your position and what they're looking for. And then maybe I might have something I want to maybe not take out of their game, but possibly add to their game. Um, you need a lot of patience with that. And you, you, you do, you know, your skills are tested. Um, but I'd always look at it that it's, a, it's an add-on for the player. So the crossover between the players is interesting there, Colin. Obviously, you mentioned working with home-based players, some of the players as as well you alluded to that are starting to go over to England to start out their professional careers. So you have that mix of home-based players versus players coming back from England or other were abroad. With the example there of Gavin, Gavin Mizzunu in the photo who had been with Chama Provers and had just gone to Manchester City as well, so he was still doing his education in Ireland, but he was also going over to Manchester City at the time. How how important is that? Obviously, we've got the underage leagues and the the SSE Archery League, you know, and and there's it's starting to show that they can produce players because in your final squad you did have a number of players that were home based like Brandon Halt and James Forlong and Ronan McKinley. Yeah, so in the squad, so just to mention the people, it's the UEFA rule. You can you can only have twenty players in your squad. Believe it or not, up to two years ago it was it was eighteen. So yeah, you can have twenty players. Of this squad of ours that, that, that went to the Euros, um, 16 of the players were homegrown. Um, four of those were home-based um, in, w- w- that made the squad. But, you know, there was 16 homegrown. 12 of them went to the UK. What was re- what's really interesting, Gareth, is, is to see the swing this year. Just to make th- that point, um, you know, the group this year had 14 home-based players. Um, out of a squad of 20 in an event we did in February. So the National League is, 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 is really, really important to us, um, especially as we go forward. Um, it's a massive part, I believe, in, in our development of the game. I think there's a lot of good things working on them. There's a lot of things we have to improve regarding the resource to it. But that, that swing, what I've seen in 12 months, uh, you know, it could be an indicator to the way things are going to go. And also with Brexit coming, um, it's something we have to be very mindful of because one of the things on the table there is that players may not be able to sign in the UK till they're 18 or actually go to the UK till they're 18, should I say. Yeah. Um, so clubs might get deals done a year or two earlier, but they mightn't be able to actually go till they're 18. So there's a massive onus now as, a, as us as Football Association, um, clubs, all the stakeholders, um, 
to really to, to look deeply know where we're going with, with the national leagues um, because they're an important part of our, our future. We obviously focus a lot, Colin, on, on the players for obvious reasons, but the coaching development of the national league is important too, isn't it? You mentioned, you know, players in UK clubs who might not have as close a relationship with a coach with Southampton or Manchester United, but you know, the coaches that are working with the clubs the same paths or Derry City or Finn Harps might be different because you can work directly with them on a daily basis. Yeah, look, you know, we, we're very good coaches. Um, the coach education system has really, really improved. And I think, you know, even Nyla Regan, our head of education, and, you know, the plan he has for it for maybe the next four to five years is it looks very exciting. You know, it, it's very well structured between grassroots and, um, and the elite side. And it's just, it's a big part of where we're going now because that, that, that education with coaches is massively important to, to the development of the players. You know, what to be doing at certain ages, why you're doing it. The coach himself developing. A lot of coaches might come into the coaching setup from playing. And next thing you're, you're working with nine-year-olds. It's a complete different skill set. Massive uh, difference. Are you going to National League? Um, you're working with 13 year olds, you're working with 15 year olds, um, even learning how to work with that age, how to speak with them even. You might have loads of knowledge on the game, um, but uh, these, these young boys will put you to the test, believe me. Very good. Before we go into the, you know, we touched into the whole transfer training to the game, I suppose some of the key differences, we've kind of mentioned that about the European qualification campaign, but, you know, a few big things we would have had, you know, we'd had more certainty, around a lot of things we mentioned earlier. This would have been the big area as well. There would have been far more media, um, that, you know, especially playing at home. Um, so that, that was something we had to manage as well. And, and also in the lead up to, you know, we had that up, upheaval in the, in the association. And that was something, you know, we, we were questioning on a lot in, in, the, you know, in the media war doing their bits and pieces with us. But the players themselves would have got a lot of education on it. They get a lot of that on social media. Uh, so that, that would have been a new experience for them. You know, the games are going to be live on television. Uh, so you, just more interest there. So managing that was something new to us and, and had to put the, those strategies in place. And that's where someone like yourself, Gara, would have been a, a help to us as well. Um, and then the whole area with you know they're just we knew there was going to be more support. There's going to be fans. Um, you know that's an exciting time for the players. A lot of these wouldn't have played in front of four or five thousand people before. Uh, so that was going to be a new experience for them. And and, and when we did report in, uh, we actually brought them to the home game. Shamrock Rovers were playing at home that night, so we brought them to Tala just to sample the atmosphere. There would have been a good crowd there. Uh, just to begin the preparation in a kind of social way with the players first um, before we kind of hit the pitch running. How do, I know you, you've you experienced two uh, tournaments before, Colin, uh, with seven ins. In, in Croatia, probably a little bit different, uh, probably not as much hype than in England in, in 2018 when you got, got through uh, against Holland. There was a, a lot of att immediate attention around that one, especially of how that game ended for Ireland as well with the, with the penalty shootout and uh, but when you went into this tournament in 2019, as you say, more media for a head coach at underage level. How how did you find that experience? Um, look, it, it was interesting. Um, look, you know, through my own career, you had I had parts in the media as well, or, or done bits, so I, ha I had a bit of experience. But you know, it's, it's just to, to you know to have your plan um, to, to to keep the focus on what you're actually there for. Um, and you know the real attention you were looking to bring to it was for the players. It's 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 really their their experience. That's the business we're in as well with, with, with young players. Um, you know it's about them getting experiences. And as a footballer, the whole area now with them, we say social media. That, that's a big challenge, and, and they need a lot of education and that. But no, we, we just try to keep it keep it very much to about the tournament and uh, trying to get the players to to, to experience um, that side of uh, the, the the game as well. Uh, Colin, from my perspective, it was, it was a great experience uh, being a media officer with your team. And um, I think it's an important point to note that these are young men that haven't experienced media before, uh, many of them, and they haven't had much training. So we really had to insinuate the positives with them so that we could get positive messages out through the media and for them to feel comfortable with that. Um, working with yourself, having individual meetings and staff meetings and getting feedback, and working with the players to make them feel relaxed and making sure we do. Uh, media events as far in advance of match day as we, as we could 
Yeah, it's just that whole plan, really, really, really important and having the links with yourselves and communication. Um, but I think some of the, you know, the key points that, you know, that it doesn't become a distraction um, and, and, and it's, it's an experience for the players as well. You know, it's something they're going to have to, to do as they go along, no doubt, in, in their careers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more education for them. Um, but the key thing for us and the technical staff is that, you know, it doesn't interfere with the, 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 the key the key objectives of wider there. Yeah, it was a it was a very positive experience overall. And I, th I think the players actually enjoyed the experience, you know, we talking to not just local media but national media as well. So um but as my job is make sure that the media is not a distraction and so that you can focus on the training aspects, which is what you're kind of moving on to next. Yeah, so so just building into the first game. So um I suppose Basically, you know, this is just going to look a little bit from transfer training to the game, some key considerations. You know, planning an organization would be key. Um, we work off a concept of a reality-based learning, which is something that's coming from UEFA as well. And, you know, a lot of it's your own game analysis, your own team, opposition, uh, your football plan, which is periodization. Um, and, and, and that really, you know, from an international point of view, what you do with the players when they report in um, determines a lot what they did before they came into you. Do you understand me? So, yeah. you know, you can control what they've done the weeks before it. Some of them uh, might have been, you know, hard weeks leading into it. They might have not had hard weeks. Some of them have a lot of games under their belts. Some maybe not. Um, so you can only control what you can when they come in. Uh, we would keep in touch with the clubs leading up to it, especially that kind of two-week period out from the, from the actual uh, tournament. Um, but what was really interesting with this one, a lot of players would have played on the Saturday, and that would go for a lot of nations. That would be the same right across Europe. Saturday is a big day for, for, for youth football. Um, we would have started our training on the Tuesday, which we were playing on the Friday. So they would have, they would have recovered well, um, and we would have been able to go hard in that first session, basically, then. Uh, so that was a big plus, and that's not always the way. Uh, sometimes that first session could be just a recovery. Um, but that planning for that, planning for that tournament periodization is always a challenge. Um, the training environment, that would be really important to us. Um, you know, the environment around training, basically staff, players, that whole mood, uh, the standards we'd be looking for. And then, you know, trying to execution of the plan, basically, um, is always a challenge. And just that little bit at the end, you know, all the players and staff have to realise, you know, our, our time is precious um, because... That's, this is what we would have had a leading into the, the first game. Um, as I said, the players report in on Tuesday. There's your Wednesday, Thursday. Or sorry, the players report in on a Monday. So it would been Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, game on the Friday. Um, and basically, you've got your three training sessions. Uh, we'd normally train, we try and maybe train morning sessions, maybe between 11 and 12. It just gives us longer recovery then uh, throughout the day and opportunities to put it's into our team meetings but the first session really as I said like it depends how they come into you we were happy with where they were at um, and that determined what we could do and again we, we, we'd have that link you know what what Rude has put in place around us with, regarding structures and support is really important so Dan Horn would be head of fitness uh, for, for all the teams and, you know, we'd have that support network pre-tournament as well to, to speak to, 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 to look at what we're doing uh, and, and to pick some of the experts' brains in that area as well. So that's important for us as a head coach. Um, but it was great in that first session. We, we, we knew we, we could do, little, you know, we could go hard and we could go, go a little bit extra with the players. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of visuals with that. And then the second session might have been a little bit more moderate. Uh, still good intensity to it, but you mightn't be working as hard and uh, as long. And the third one then is that pre-game uh, session. So then you're into the, the opening game. But each one of them would have an objective. Um, and, and we're just going to go through here now as well, maybe um, why we actually uh, did what we did in, in, in the session and um, a couple of clips of where it came out in the game. This, this is where it all started, Colin, in terms of your preparation. So... You got clips of the Greek team. Greece was their first game in the tournament, and you got uh, clips, and I think they're playing, is it Ukraine in this one? Yes, yeah, so this would have been some clips from their um, their elite phase, which they would have taken part in March, which qualified them to the tournament. 
Um, the video footage with, with this level, it can be, you know, can be very good sometimes. Sometimes it can be very far away. What you get, what you have to deal with, and that's where you know your your video analyst people are, are, are really really important. So Michael's done a really good job for us here. Um, so I know sharing clips on whether it's Zoom or Teams that sometimes it might look jumpy. So we, we, we've done a couple of drawings to just highlight a few things uh, with regards for, for, for people looking in and to try and match it up to the game. And these are just samples that the players might have seen as well and, and might have picked out. Um, it's not the whole package, but they're just samples. And, and um, it's just that concept of, of you know, analysis, training, game, basically. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is Greece. And this might be, they're in the blue. Um, and it's just something with so you can highlight the right side of centre back on the ball and, and, and basically we're just showing here this might be something we show the players it's just that concept of there, there, there may be their team formation in build up um, but it's really for the players just to say look this is, this is basically their, their, their team formation and, and, and this might be something they look to do in their build up so you see the movement they started with four a flat run from the, 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 the winger then to go behind Centre forward comes off the front. They don't exploit it. Ukraine read it well. But that would be just something the players be mindful of to see and, and might be something we might have to look at. Uh, this then would be a defending clip. So they're in, they're in blue here, the, 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 the Greece team. Um, Ukraine players on the ball. And this now might have led us to something we might look to take a bit of, um, say, to exploit or for us to get an opportunity from. So you can see the two centre forwards are highlighted. They're defending in 4-4-2. But that distance between the centre forwards and back four, we might have had a couple of clips and felt mm, there, there, there's some space in between the lines here, between the back four and midfield four, um, which we will have had a couple of clips of. You can highlight there and you can see the space. Opposition don't exploit it this time, but it would have been something we might have said, OK, let's maybe design or, or try and plan to to do something to take advantage of. Here they're in white, and this is something we needed to be aware of. They're playing Kosovo here in an elite phase. Um, so they're just building. They don't take the option to build across. They, they just go with a long ball here. Um, they look to fight for seconds. There'd be that in the Greece players. But the key thing here is the centre forward. We, we've highlighted him always on the shoulder of the inside or outside of centre backs. And out of nothing, they get a penalty. Um, so his movement was really, really good, scored a lot of their goals and was a real key player for them. Here again, they're defending. And it's just something to highlight to our back four midfielders. So Kosovo on possession. They lose possession in the middle third. And again, Greece pick it up. And if you highlight the right back, no urgency to get in. Again, centre forward for... for, for for Greece, off the shoulder, two forward passes, chops inside, and he scores. So he would have been a, a key player for them. And, you know, they're just some samples of maybe, okay, here's something we can maybe try and exploit. But, hey, this is something we have to be, we have to be mindful of. Why, why um, would you have shown those clips to the players, Colin, uh, in advance of this training session? Yeah, so, they would, they, so they, they, this would be the – they might have seen this, these clips um, – We'll say in, in in the meeting prior to training, um, and then you know we we, we build a session, uh, maybe to, to to look at what objective we might work on then from, from the clips. And this is uh, a, this is, this is your fourth session in the FUI National Training Centre. Then preparing for for that fourth game. Yes, it is. So it's 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 again. It's this this would be you know we were able to do eighty minutes here. This part of the session. Um, it's kind of our last maybe 30 minutes of the session. It's where we're doing maybe a bit of tactical work. But before we go into anything about the game, just with the organisation, you know, firstly, we're playing the full length of the pitch. As I said, the players can do a bit extra today so we can get in. Uh, the, the distances can be big with them today. So, so leading into this session, um, there would have been practices done where, you know, players... They can cover bigger distances, you know, the passes from you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 yards. Um, so th they're prepped um, to, to come into this. Um, that, that's just an important point to make. The pitch itself is cut. So to the left side, we'd have a set of cones running from the edge of the 18 yard box to the outside line. And basically, the opposition who are lined up here and are one team lined up in, in the blue circles, they'd have two centre backs 
They'd have a midfield four and they'd have two strikers. So it's preparing the players, well, this is now what you're going to play against. Uh, this is always a challenge for an international coach. At this stage, we've only 18 players at this part of the session. Uh, so you always need to have maybe two or three plans for what you're going to do. And, 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 and the 9v9 um, practice here is trying to replicate what the players are going to come across in the opening game in, in, when we're in possession. So that would be a task for, for, for one of the coaches. So Kevin might have this group, giving them a few points before they start. Ian might have the second group, which we'll show here. So there you see the setup for one team. And basically, the orange team are set up from goalkeeper, back four, midfield triangle, and a striker. And the method we've used here, with people will learn in the coach education courses as well, as coaches, we're working here for just two blocks of 10 minutes. Yeah. So there's going to be no stops. So the methodology we use is we'll coach at a, nat a natural break. So after 10 minutes, players will come in. Coaches will have maybe three minutes uh, to make a few points uh, in regards to what they've seen. Or we might change the objective. It depends what we're working on. Players go again for, for another 10 minutes. And maybe that second block, if they're fatiguing a little bit at seven or eight, we might then we might just, just bring them in. So you'd be able to keep an eye on that. Um, but that would be the setup. So there, both teams are tasked up. Um, and it's Sorry, Colin, just on, on the setup there, the, the decision to go with a midfield three and a lone striker, is that because of what you've seen from Greece already? Or would you, or would you have already had a bit of an idea of what way you want to set your team up anyway? Yeah, well, we'd always, through the season, we would have played with, it, with, with a midfield triangle. As I said maybe earlier, how we might play it might depend on who we have and what team we're playing. Um, but no, each of the age groups would have that uh, shape from the midfield before they'd come into us as well. Uh, so we're just adding maybe to it now as well. But okay. yeah, so it's, it's, it's trying to see, can that three take advantage maybe of the two? But playing, so that back four and midfield three, trying to break the two strikers and the midfield four. Yeah. Those, those key players in that area of the pitch uh, for, this, for this part of the session would be really important. We might flip it then in the second part where you're now playing with two centre-backs, three midfielders and a front three. So you go and bring your wingers into play sure. against opposition full-backs. So this game basically, I said at the start, the organisation part of it is, you know, one team is tasked in the opposition's possible shape. Um, one team is tasked, in, especially two units, into, into how we play. Okay. So... Coaches, have said, we'll speak to them then at the half. I said, we might change the objective. We're trying to play it through here. We might go longer with a point in the second uh, part of this um, and how we change the organisation. That'll depend on what we see. But from a coaching side, they're playing and the methodology used is, is, is they stop in the, and, and at the natural stop at the half time, basically. Um, so that, that, would have, that would have been the main part of, of that session on the first day. Then going into the second session, basically, um, we'll just let this play out. So just so players have to be patient, still working on options and angles, all the key parts of the game. So day two, um, players would have been they've gone through maybe their activation, their warm-up, a couple of prep practices. No, sometimes we look at splitting the group. So you can't see the right side, but Ian Hill would have taken a group of players, attacking players working on some principles of that half of the pitch. Yeah. And in here, we kind of have a semi approach practice. So if you're looking at it, you see the back four and a middle two, or sorry, a front two that they're playing against. And you also see that midfield triangle as well. There's mannequins used just to give the players some distances and a bit of a feel. We're going to get out. You're overloaded to get out. But the key objective of this, um, which we play on, it's basically about us breaking lines and it works in two folds because in a prep game leading into this, when we lost the ball in midfield, in the transition, the opposition scored from. So if you see here, we're coaching now is the coach in the flow. The shoot, that player is now getting out of midfield. Left full is supporting ball side. But that back three so and the goalkeeper, really, really important to this point and objective that you see the red player circled. Yeah. That's the, that might be the Greece number nine. 
yeah. that listen we we're getting out here but don't forget about him when we're when we're playing so you're you're trying to get that point across the defenders sometimes when you're doing these practices there might be spectators or they're giving you the answers you really want them doing those football actions here now where they make that sprint or they they, they push up with the game yeah. and as a coach you now we're, we're just coaching in the flow and to keep the shape of it there as you see I think in the right back position, I think that might be Sean McAvoy there of how the, he's tucked all the way in there so that it's it's narrowing the gaps. Yeah, it's, it's just we're just putting that seed into their, their minds that you know we we got out here in midfield, um, but you, you're you're getting up to play and you know you you're closing up the back door. So that back four of ours now is maybe coming into a back three, but really key to the centre backs that you know we showed you a clip about their number nine that if yeah. we did lose the ball in the middle of the park in the game. Um, that they're in a better position uh, to maybe intercept or, or, or delay the play if it's turned over in, in, in transition. And is that also as well, Colin, to, because of the Greeks number nine winning that penalty to make sure or to limit the amount of time that he might be in a one-on-one situation with a defender? Yeah, so, so he was a danger goal. player. He was a key player, scored lots of goals and you know we needed to look at maybe suffocating some of the supply to him and you know you can't do that all the time or, or put everything on a session on, on, on one player but this was just mm-hmm. a part. But as I was saying, it was also twofold because in, in their preparation game against Finland, we had lost the ball building up in a similar position like this um, and within you know seven, eight seconds, the opposition has scored. Uh, so it was something from our own performance we'd evaluated and it also worked into uh, being mindful of something with the opponent then. Okay. So that would have been a key part of that session. Going in then to the, the we'll say the third day, um, one of the areas then were not going to be as long on the pitch, but now we would have looked at some of our defending strategy high up the pitch. Um, over the season, we would have looked at a, a couple of different ways we would have defended. Um, here, we're working with the, the two units high up the pitch, the, the front three and middle three. And nowhere, as a coach, we're now, we're, we're now in, in, in that freeze methodology. So, you know, you're painting a picture, you're freezing the game, uh, they'll have bursts of play, and then you might stop it and paint the pictures um, for them. But here, it's, it's, it's really we're looking to trap the team to the side. As you saw with the build-up, with, with some bits with Greece, they, they, they like to go into maybe the midfield too. Um, that's where maybe we're trying to show them. With our six players, um, a lot of detail here. We're going through with the, getting pressure on the ball, the role of the centre-forward. So he doesn't get tight to the left side of centre-back. He also in a position to block the pass back to the goalkeeper. But if it yeah. does go back to the left side of the back, or left side of centre back, he can press the covering players. So between these two, the, the advanced midfielder or one of the screeners. Sometimes the screener will press in on this player, depending on the situation of the game, and, and, and the ten might take the second player. And if you look at this, would be Joe Hodge. He might come across and screen. So basically, there'd be that type of work and principles done with that front six um, when we might have to do this in the game, and and also you know if that player swivels out and he's got to pass on to the right side of centre-back, that opposite winger might be ready to spring as well. So it's, it's, it's working the detail with those six players on their positioning, why we're doing it. And then when we win it back, you know, it's not just defending. It's, it's that whole, you know, what happens in the transition. So we would always look then, if we do win it back, that at least four players need to come alive um, in the break. So there would have been some parts we would have done um, in the tactical side and, and, and then just on a set play, so Ian Hill would have been leading this part of it. This would have been done after the defending, um, we say, a session. Sometimes in the set plays, we may have the players playing a game, call a set play, uh, but this, this just period we have the players set up. Um, the same principle or the same set play would be from either side. It's been led by another coach. Uh, organization wise Kevin and myself would still make sure to observe to have footballs on the ready that if, if, that if Ian changes something on the set play like to the other side that the organization is ready to go it's, it's really important f- for us as coaches from that side of it uh, so we've got two players inside the six we've got three players in the pack and really all we're highlighting you know that delivery to go 
we, we were saw an area maybe that might have been free around the back post. We were trying to isolate Andrew, and then it's his choice to maybe put the ball back across the face of goal, and, and you'll have maybe numbers to, to go on attack. So that, that would have been some samples from, from, from training. Important points, you see the tent with, behind the lines, that space where they speak about, centre back and step in. No, good timing, good quality pass. Now you can link it to the wide players. Some good combination on the outside. And Festi's just got a stretch for the return. He's a little bit off balance. So that space there, you see it exploited. So they're getting a feel of it now. So here again, centre half, really important. They've got that action that they can step in. The head is up. And now you can see two players behind the lines, that space we spoke about. Option right may be cut off, option left is open. The triangle has changed a little bit, and here now really important. So we don't we don't execute the, the final pass, we say, and, and this will be something the players would have done through the season, or, or as I said in one of the, the parts of the training session, okay, we turn the ball over. Yeah. Now you're in that moment of transition to defend. Um, and those six players high up the pitch, you'll see the reactions. The opposite wide player now ready to react. The players around the ball, so they're anticipating it. They're forcing the opposition into hurry their passes, and you win it back, and you can rebuild again. So does that be a real big part of it as well for them, Garrett? Yeah, being able to work both sides of the ball really, and and being being aware of it. Absolutely, really important for them. Even though you might be working on an attacking part of it. What happens yeah, when the ball does get turned over? And here, just on the other side of the pitch, same principle. Greece are building out. You're trying to show them to the sides. You've got pressure. Players are set. They're ready. Midfielders in this time on. They're, 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 they're holding midfielder. You win it back. And then all of a sudden, you, you go into a 4v4. Yeah. And just that final pass, just slightly behind that, but leads to a corner and the party might have saw on training so it's from the other side but the same principle player you're trying to highlight yeah big andrew I'm on, I'm on my deli. Yeah. greens are proactive around the box and the players score so exactly so, just as exactly as illustrated there the actual set piece big andrew goes to the back heads it back across face a goal and Matt Everett started to hook it in. Yeah, so so they're, they're just some samples. So it's always that challenge of, we say, you know, building some parts of the session that you've analysed maybe to your own team or the opposition, uh, designing it then uh, before the pitch and executing on the pitch. And then, and then to see, you know, to see parts where it comes out on, on the pitch, that's really important for players learning at this age group as well and for them to buy into it because, you know, when they see themselves do it, um, you know, they, they they have an understanding now of, of of the concept. There's there's a balance of strike, Colin, isn't there, between setting up to nullify the opposition and to also play your own game, isn't there? Yeah, there is a balance, and it also depends who you're playing. Like you know, you can never, you know, we never feel inferior to any opposition. That wouldn't be in any of our players' makeup or our staff's makeup. But you have to be mindful as well at times, again, of maybe who you have or who you're playing. But, you know, we'd always be very balanced with the players. We try and, you know, evaluate our own performances all the time, always try and improve ourselves. Um, but, you know, they're playing international football. They're going to come across some high-level players and movements maybe that they mightn't come across all the time. And that's where they need you as a coach um, to, to, to maybe identify those areas and, and, and then put a process in place to help them. Okay, Colin, uh, we're coming to the end of the presentation now. Uh, what's your conclusion? Yeah, I suppose just looking at this, I suppose summary or conclusion, you know, whatever level you're working at, but I suppose, you know, I'm, when you're working at international level or if you're, you're taking a representative team, there's a lot of things you can't control. So that, that's the first point I just wanted to, 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 to maybe give people insight on or to think about is you just have to master the skills of what you can control. Uh, it's, it's really, really important if, you, if, you, if you're taking, say, interleague teams or representative teams, because uh, there's a lot of things that you can't control that you could really wrestle with and psychologically maybe get down over or, or find a challenge. 
uh, that you really have to master what you can. So something very simple like forward planning, really, really big part, important skill to try and master if, you, if, you, if you're taking representative teams. Um, the importance of delegation, um, you just can't do everything. Um, you've got to have a real good backroom team and uh, that, that's a real, that, that's, an, that's an important part. Yeah, and, and each time you come together, it's just setting out your, you know, having those clear goals and objectives and, um, you know, setting the high, high standards in, in that preparation phase um, is really important to, to, your, to your season ahead. And then finally, your, your standards that you're setting. Really, really important, yeah. Setting the high standards for, for the year ahead. Uh, you know, it has to start the first time your players come in, whether it's the start of the season for your club. Um, and, and, you know, when you're working with the, the, the younger players, you always have to wrap back in, you know, have to back in the mind that you're, you know, you have to be a role model as well. But the, um, the high standards are important from, from, from day one. Okay. You have an assignment um, for any coaches who are either UA for license or grassroots coaches can get involved to earn three hours CPD with this? Yes, so uh, if you choose to accept, um, design a staff template and outline each of the staff specific sp tasks pre tournament. Um, so from the tournament draw to the opening game. So basically, all I'm looking for um, is a template that you can design, but just looking for it to consist the staff position. So a head coach, what do you think their key tasks are from when that tournament draw was made to the opening game, the assistant coach, and so on. So reference back to the slide of what people were in the staff and um, just put in their position and put in what you think were their, their key tasks in that period of time. Just use bullet points to outline the tasks. Um, doesn't have to be a thesis, no. Um, so the bullet points will will do fine and the template should be no more than three A4 type pages. So there's a little challenge for your skills to, to get all that in, in that, um, in that setup. And you have a, a week to complete that assignment up until uh, <clears throat> Saturday, June the 6th, 11 o'clock, if you can email it to, is it cobrian at fai.ie? That's it. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, Colin, I, I hope uh, people can get involved with that. Um, <laughs> a bit of a mixture of uh, emotions there from the from Josh and from Matt there. Uh, it sums up your the tournament. Fantastic tournament um, and fantastic insight uh, from you, Colin. Thanks very much. I think coaches at all levels will be able to take a lot from this. Thanks very much, Garrett. Yeah, and look, I just left that uh, pictures at the very end. It's probably something we're all missing um, for any young boy and girl. That's the journey they're going to be on in their game. You know, there's going to be... There's going to be tears on your journey and you know there's going to be there's going to be joy as well along the way and hopefully we'll be all getting back to that um, over the next few months.